presentation, as we explained earlier, we'll do questions uh, by raising hands. We'll get a mic to you, and then from there, uh, we'll just ask you to identify yourself before asking a question. Uh, <coughs> Coach, I hope you go ahead and get us started with your opening statement. We'll have a experience, and then we'll get rolling. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this has been a, a great week uh, for our staff, our families, and, and our players. I want to thank Steve Hogan and everybody associated with Florida City Sports. Um, it's a first-class operation. Uh, they've done a tremendous job of creating a great experience and, and uh, taking care of everybody uh, the entire week. It's been fun for myself, my wife, and a lot of our staff uh, to be back in the great city of Orlando. A lot of great memories uh, having spent three years here. And uh, it's been fun to catch up with a lot of familiar faces, uh, those at UCF, uh, but also throughout the entire community. Uh, it's been a fun week to, to kind of go back and, and uh, get a chance to see a lot of people that have helped me on my journey and, and been a part of uh, the success that we've had, um, you know, at the uh, previous stop at, at UCF. And um, <clears throat> excited about the game uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is a, a big time college football game, a great way to kick off uh, 2024. Uh, we recognize uh, Coach Ferentz and his staff and, and their program, what they've done this year, but uh, uh, during the course of uh, his tenure as well. Um, they play extremely tough, smart, and physical. Uh, great opponent, and uh, looking forward to kicking off. Coach Ferentz, we'll let you go for a moment. Same thing. Just, you know, it's great to be here first and foremost. Uh, we were here two years ago, and I was at an event last night. I uh, worked with a guy named Bill Brazier back in the 80s on Coach Fry's staff, defensive coordinator, and he had a Saying he says, you know, there's no such thing as a bad, bad bowl game. Some are just better than others, and uh, I can tell you firsthand, this is one of the best out there. It's just a uh, fantastic experience for everybody involved, our players first and foremost, staffs, families, the uh, travel uh, party. So it's just been been outstanding. Uh, as Josh said, the you know Steve and the whole committee do still a wonderful job. So we're certainly uh, thrilled to be back in Orlando and have a chance to play in a, a game like this and. <laughs> Yeah, you know, bowl games are special. They're really special. They're special for the players, special for everybody involved. And uh, to be in Orlando and, and be part of the uh, Cheez-It City <laughs> Bowl is just a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for us. So we're very appreciative of that. Uh, a couple things about bowl games. Typically, you know, every time you're in one, you're going to play an outstanding opponent. In our case, we tend to be the underdogs. I think it's been all but maybe two uh, in our 20 plus years. So that kind of seems to be the way it is. But, you know, bottom line is both teams have earned the right to play in a game like this. Um, it, it really is significant in that way, and yeah, there are other commonality to bowl games. It's the last game uh, that our teams will be together. You know, both teams, team staffs, etc. So, makes it makes it a little bit uh, unique in that way, a little bit bittersweet. Uh, certainly, the goal this week for for us is like every each and every week, you just want to try to play your best game. And the challenges of the month are a little bit different. I think that's probably the biggest change. So, I uh, have tremendous respect for Tennessee. Josh has done a great job. Is uh, any local people well know he did an outstanding job here. Everywhere you've been, uh, he's done an outstanding job. And uh, no different in Tennessee. They're just a really, uh, really good football team. Put a lot of pressure on their offensive system. Uh, a lot of stress uh, on your defense. Uh, they're off our defensive team. You know, very athletic, good up front. A lot of big, strong guys that are active and physical. And uh, special teams are very impressive as well. Uh, the punter's done a really nice job. Really good place kicker, outstanding punt returner, and uh, so you know, just a lot, lot to prepare for. A lot of challenges out there for us tomorrow. So, yeah, we're just uh, excited to be here. And uh, last game of the season again. Like I said, it's it's really a special thing. Uh, a lot of people involved, and uh, think about a guy, our, our equipment guy, Greg Morris, 23 years uh, as our head equipment guy, and 30 30 plus years in the program. I uh, was a student at Iowa. Just uh, it's his last game as well. So. Yeah, just a lot of a lot of little side stories, if you will, but it's really all about the game, and we're excited to get out there and have a chance to compete tomorrow. Thank you both. I didn't see any early hands, but if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll get started with. Uh, we'll go to the blue riser, blue shirt, and the riser in the back, and then we'll move up front. We don't have a mic. We'll, move up. we'll start up front, and then we'll go to the blue riser in the back since we already got a mic up here. Good morning, gentlemen. Happy New Year. Uh, Kyle Nash with the three-point conversion. Um, I have a question for each of you. We'll start with Coach Ferentz. Uh, both of you are making a return to Orlando in your each unique way. Coach Ferentz, last time you were here in Orlando uh, for the Citrus Bowl, we talked about the state of college football and how it changed and all that. You mentioned the text from Coach Stoops. It was an excellent story. Um, but to bring it here, what has helped you? What have you done to kind of maintain that success to return to the Citrus Bowl? 
Well, yeah, sorry to say two years later, we're in worse shape than we were two years ago. I think it was possible that uh, uh, we, the adults, have done a lot to really kind of screw this thing up. And, and we've got a great game. Uh, so I do, you know, old guy in the room, I've got some concerns about what the future is going to look like. Um, I think most people are aware that we have some real issues right now. I'm not sure what we uh, can come to agreement what the remedies may be. But, you know, you see a lot of things that just concern you. Um, and again, there's, there's a lot of moving parts, so I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers. But uh, despite all the challenges, I think the thing that remains consistent, the single best part about what we do is get to work with, you know, really high quality young people. And, and that hasn't changed. It was the same way two years ago, ten years ago. And, um, you know, that, that's a part you, you really enjoy. And uh, I've always told people, I think at any job, you know, you got X amount of percent of things you don't really look forward to doing. And then uh, another percent, hopefully, you do like doing. And if that, that percent outweighs the other side, then you know, it's still a pretty good deal. Thank you, Glenn. And Coach Heifel, um, you started out uh, at UCF, your previous job there. I used to do weekly pressers with you as well. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, how, have, um, how have you uh, changed as a coach with your time at Tennessee since uh, you left Orlando? Yeah, yeah I think when, uh, no matter what role uh, you're in and in whatever profession you're in, you continue to learn how to become a better communicator, how to impact the people around you uh, in a positive way. Um, you continue to refine. Uh, what you're doing inside of your program 365 days out of the year uh, to allow kids to go be their best and create a culture uh, that they enjoy being in and, and love competing in and uh, you know just continue to do that you learn so much um, you know as a leader of the program you learn so much from the people around you and in particular student athletes and, and uh, you know those guys have been instrumental in the growth of, of who we are and what we do all right, now I'll go to the back. Yeah, sure. Uh, Owen Sebring with KGA and NC Rapids. This question is for Coach Heifel. Uh, I believe your year at Oklahoma, Chuck Long would have been your quarterback coach. I think. Well, I, man, we had a lot of Iowa guys uh, down in, uh, in Oklahoma. I, I was just curious if you saw any sort of relationship with Coach Long or if, uh, if some of the things that you might have learned from him as, as your coach back then. Man, I, I learned a lot from, uh, from Coach Long. Um, he helped refine me fundamentally, uh, helped me continue to grow in my understanding of, of the football game how to lead the people around me um uh, you know that staff was filled with you know the stoops brothers um you know jonathan hayes uh, was there as well um you know those guys are are all have all made such an impact in, in who i am and, and what we do uh inside of our program um you know look at the success that we had uh, that was because of a lot of the things that they learned while they were at Iowa uh, as players and as coaches and uh, have good relationships with a lot of those guys where I still uh, talk to them, um, you know, periodically throughout the year. We'll go to the front right here. This is for both of you guys as well. Um, back to what Kyle was talking about earlier, the December crush and how you guys dealt with it with guys up to now, the transfer portal, signing day, all of this that you've had to deal with, with all <coughs> preparations and uh, how, how did that affect you, and how did you go through that? You want to answer that one? Neither of us do, quite frankly. I think, you know, Coach kind of alluded to it, the, the calendar in which we operate now, um, you know, it changes the way December and, you know, part of January unfolds for you. I think, you know, as we continue to move forward in this great game is something that, uh, that we have to look at. Um, it's different because, you know, when your regular season ends, you go through exit interview process. Each individual, in each individual player is in a, in a different position, and you know for a period of time there's some uncertainty um, with a portion of your roster. And uh, you know for us, I think is <clears throat> we finished up signing day. That kind of became you know the the lead into the bowl game where uh, you felt good about who was there, uh, where they were at, their ability to play in the game, and uh, you know be a part of your roster. We'll take one down. It's, it's just, you know, it's just a different world. Um, even 20 years ago, you had guys possibly opting out for the NFL. Not, not near the extent now. Uh, but there, there's just a lot of parties involved now. It's not always healthy voices uh, that the players hear. And some of the parties involved aren't necessarily thinking about what's best for the individual young people. And that's, you know, it just kind of flies in the face of what we try to do as, as coaches, I think. So... That's part of it, and um, you know, as Josh alluded to, we, we've opened the rules up now, where it's really easy for people to make bad decisions. Um, and I, I've always, not always, but uh, for for a while, now, I've been just uh, concerned about you know how our, our thirst for the playoffs and our thirst for the national championship race, two teams, four teams, uh, with all the focus going there with the public and the media, 
uh, really diminishes some of the other bowls. And our first bowl game in 2001 was the San Antonio Alamo Bowl. And, uh, you know, we won it. Bob Sanders, the shortest guy in the field, came out with the ball. Uh, Wes Welker was in that group to another short guy, but two pretty good players. Sanders comes out of the game with the, the ball at the end. They threw a Hail Mary. And uh, it was like we won the Super Bowl. Like, that was a really important game, an important year for us. Our third year, and you know, we put, didn't turn the corner, but at least we were showing some progress, making traction. So, you know, those games do mean a lot. They mean a lot for the people involved. And I just think right now there's a trend where, like, you know, it's not the whatever game. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. And I think everybody's ever played the game. That's why you play. You play to go out and compete, do your best every opportunity. And when I coached at Worcester Academy, every game was important. So, uh, you know, we, we've really drifted drift away from that a little bit, and I think that's unfortunate because a lot of people are missing out on some really special experiences, and that's, that's too bad. And then we'll take two down front here side by side, one on the riser, and then we'll come back up. Hey, Kirk, right down here, ElliotClawRisers.com. Uh, you got Luke Lachey, Jay Higgins coming back. I, I, as you're looking to uh, bring some more of those guys back who are considering NFL options, i just curious as to how important a foundation of bringing Luke and Jay back, two team captains already, and, and know they're back next season. Yeah, it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, those guys are so respected in the program, for, for rightfully so. They've earned it. So that, that doesn't hurt. But, you know, my only request for our players, um, particularly the last 10 days, was, you know, if, you're, if you haven't made a decision, you know, compartmentalize that stuff. It's kind of like high school kids with recruiting. Don't let that dominate your life. You're look, spending all the time looking over the fence. and. Uh, it can be really distracting. It's hard. It's a really hard thing for the young people to go through two years ago. Uh, I thought Riley Moss was a little distracted down here, quite frankly. Uh, and then he surprised us all and came back, and he was not distracted his senior year. But, but it's a tough thing for young people to deal with. So our request is, you know, just put it on the shelf. Uh, they've got plenty of time to make the decision when they get back. And ultimately, um, it's like recruiting in this way. You just want, you want the player to make the decisions best for him. And he's got the best seat in the house for that to... But he's got to go through it methodically, get good information and, you know, accurate information from people that actually do know, not Uncle Joe or, you know, some agent telling them, you know, this, this, and this. Uh, you know, so we just try to give them good information to deal with. Hi, Kirk. Hope you're doing well. John Sebi, Sea Rapids Gazette. Now as you wrap up year number 25, Phil Parker has been with you for all 25. Obviously the overall defensive results have been acknowledged, but there's is there anything that Phil does that you think really hasn't gotten a ton of attention that's been kind of key to his success? Well, you know, Josh mentioned uh, the Stoopses, and when I was an assistant at Iowa, I always looked at Phil. He's three three-time All-Big Ten. He's not very big, he won that fast, but he's just really smart and tough. I always felt like, you know, he could be in the Stoops family if he was a, an Iowa guy. So I had great respect for him as a player, and I've had a chance to work with him for, you know, 25 years. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, unequivocally, the best secondary coach I've ever, ever been with, and I've been around some pretty good ones. Um, he's, just a, he's a quality human being. He's, he's half crazy, I think you've noticed it. He's got a little different personality. Uh, I don't want to call it an acquired taste, but you got to... It's one of those looks he gives you. It's like, okay, yeah. Uh, but he's just a tremendous football coach. He's had two jobs his whole career. That's kind of unusual for a guy his age. Uh, but that's who he is. He just wants to coach football. He's all about the players, all about trying to get better. And, uh, you know, I think Josh you know, hit on this earlier. Just when, when you're around good people uh, on a day to day basis, players, staff, yeah, that's a fun part of it. And it's, it's neat to see Phil's efforts being recognized a little bit right now. I'm, I'm kind of surprised. Um, the national stuff because, you know, we, we normally don't get those kinds of things, but it's so deserved and just uh, really fitting. We'll move back and then we'll come back up this way. Hey, Coach Ferentz, Jake Brent, Local 5 Sports. You mentioned a lot of those bowl games losing their luster with, with opt-outs and guys just leaving, but that hasn't been the case for your program. Why is it different at Iowa? Um, I don't know if I can answer that other than you know, just despite all the changes right now, there, there are still, uh, I think there's still players out there that, that want to do it for the right reasons. Uh, and I yeah, really, really enjoy the, the, the competition of the game and, and the thing about football that is so unique. And I've, I've never coached any of those. Well, I did coach girls basketball two years. Uh, the AD made me do it at Worcester Academy. But, um, you know, football is so different because you get so many moving, moving pieces, so many parts. So, you know, uh, when guys get to, to understand what the value of teamwork and uh, working together with a bunch of folks, 
Yeah, a fifth, fifth year DB might not know a freshman offensive lineman real well, but uh, when you get them to understand that everybody's trying to do the same thing, I think it makes it really unique and special. And, um, you know, there, there, I think there's still a lot of players out there, <coughs> excuse me, that, that are motivated for that. And uh, you just got to look hard and, you know, be a little bit lucky too. But they're, uh, you know, we've been really fortunate to have a lot of good guys. And it's usually the guys in the front of the room are the ones that are, you know, I mentioned Lachey and Higgins, two guys that are great leaders. So they, they help bring other guys with them and, uh, you know, hopefully stay focused on what really is important. We're going to come down on the aisle here and on the end of the row here and then two on the left. This is for both of you. Coach Ferentz referenced the unhealthy voices that, that some kids hear. How much have you all encountered tampering and, and how big of a problem do you feel like that is in, in today's game? Yeah, so certainly uh, a part of it. Um, you know, players have so many different people um, as they're going through their process early uh, as young players. Um, you know, before the recruiting process even starts out from, you know, people that are, are training them to, to high school coaches to people that they have relationships with, 7 on 7 and that type of thing. So uh, it's certainly a, a, a part of uh, the college landscape right now. wish I had a silver bullet to, to change all of that. I don't think I did. So I'm thinking of a funny story. Uh, it's probably 15 years ago. Uh, we had a guy visit our campus for maybe all of uh, 16 hours because you know he had to move and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was told afterwards to give his his mentor Omar a uh, phone call. So anyway, I gave him a call, and uh, yeah, we're talking about about the situation a little bit. And I finally asked Omar. I said, uh, if you don't mind me asking, like, what what is your role? Like, what's your? I'm a mentor. A mentor. So the young man that we were talking about was about six foot seven, three hundred and thirty pounds. I just I didn't ask him, I was really curious, like do you mentor anybody on the chess team or the debate team? Uh, so you know, sometimes those things happen. It's really unfortunate. And um, you know, they're predators in every 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 business, every profession. But uh, yeah, you know, when people are really invested in young people, that's a good thing. And uh, you see a little drift now, some you know players uh, have to train with this guy instead of their high schools and yeah it's just it's it's a world we're living in right now and you, you know what we do isn't really that hard like training's not all that hard it's just a matter of hard work having a good plan and, and right down the list I mean none of this stuff is really that complicated but what it is complicated is just all the uh, peripheral noise and peripheral interference and all those kinds of things so again it circles back to you know you got to get kids that can focus on the things that are important and and keep their attention there, yeah, whether it's you know playing in a game like this or you know you're around. There's always something that's it's an obstacle, and distractions aren't new uh, to life. I mean, you know, I did coach like I said, started in the late '70s, but um, you know the distractions that are available now have really changed, and social media has really driven that too. But so it's just you know it's it's, it's a there's there are more things to try to be proactive about than there used to be, I guess. Hi, this is Scott Dockerman with The Athletic. This is for both coaches. Uh, as difficult as December has become with the transfer portal, with an earlier signing period, you know, God forbid you want to spend time with your family for a little bit over the holidays, and then you also have to prepare for a game. Next year it gets exponentially worse because both of you guys, both of your programs have been in competition for a, a playoff. Next year you have a 12-game playoff. Games in the middle of the, of the month how do you anticipate trying to navigate this? And is now the, the red light flashing that something absolutely has to change or you guys will either burn yourselves out or, or there'll be some tragic results? Yeah, and if you look at the placement of the, the first round of playoffs, everything that's going on in those first couple of weeks of, of December, uh, how you add in preparation for a game uh, of that size and magnitude uh, during the course of what's happening <clears throat> it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't on the phone or, or flying somewhere or in somebody's house or, you know, out of school uh, every minute of the day. Um, there's not enough time to accomplish everything that you needed to at this point in the season or at this point in the calendar, let alone if you're preparing for uh, a game like that. And, you know, that's where, I just, again, the calendar of, of how everything unfolds, the game has changed so quickly, so dramatically. Uh, I do think it's something that uh, that we got to look at. Those are just some of the un unintended consequences that we really don't give thought to before we make decisions. And yeah, the irony, in my my opinion, is it's like a lot of things that are going on right now. You know, we we always lead with you know what's what's best for the student athletes, but we don't always practice that. 
some of some of the decisions we make, and um, you know, there, there are certain absolutes I kind of try to live with. And uh, when, when you're when you're involved in game prep, when you're involved in competition, like you know, in my, in my mind, our focus needs to be on our players, the guys that are on campus. That's what we promised them in recruiting, and then you know, meanwhile we're young, play Josh, and we're flying over here and seeing this guy, and all that kind of stuff, and. Um, so it gets a little bit tricky that way, and in my mind, you know, the competition part of what we do uh, should be protected, really should be protected for everybody involved, and, you know, so there's a lot of gray area right now, and that, that's something we're going to have to work through, I think, sometimes again, that pressure, the playoff pressure, the, you know, we got to do this, got to do that. I've always marveled at, you know, North Dakota State's a great example, because they go every year and play 18 games. Like, how do you guys do that? You take finals, and all those things that they have to work through. Uh, it's, it's really a heck of a challenge. It puts a lot of pressure on the players, too. And that's uh, not to mention the wear and tear of a season, because it's, it's a hard game. It's a hard game to play. Should have asked Coach Corner that the other day. We have a, going back to the left on the pink and pink shirt, and Mike Yockey behind it. Casey K from WAT in Knoxville. This one's for Coach Heifel. You mentioned on Tuesday that Joe Milton was going to be on the sidelines during tomorrow's game. I'm just curious what role you want him to play and how beneficial that can be, not just to Nico, but to the entire team to have him there. Well, Joe's done it the right way uh, during the course of his career. Uh, you look at um, you know how everything's unfolded. It's a guy that chose to stay, uh, believed in you know his teammates, what we were building, um, and uh, how his coaching staff and the players around him were going to help him grow as a player. Um, did a lot of really great things during the course of the season. Uh, he's been a huge impact on, on our program uh, for you know game day on, on Monday. Uh, be another voice to help uh, Nico as, as he comes off the sidelines, things that are going on, um, being able to help him, you know, get ready for the next set and, and also create uh, positive energy. Um, you know, besides being the quarterback on the field, throwing the football, making decisions, uh, every other part of his, his roles that he's had during the course of the year, he can still uh, have on the sideline. Go to the left and the white shirt with the hat and then we'll go back to the right. You know, Mike Bianchi, Orlando Sentinel, Coach Hype. Um, can you elaborate just on your return to Orlando, any feelings of nostalgia, warm feelings, and also um, just uh, year three in Tennessee, where's your program at, and are, are you, did you expect it to happen so quickly? Uh, you know, as far as what we've done at Tennessee, you know, where we started uh, and took that program over at, uh, how we were be able to build a, a culture, uh, you know, re-solidify the locker room, uh, continue to grow the success that we've had. Uh, we've been disappointed with some of the results this season, obviously, but, uh, you know, who we are, what we're about, and how we're continuing to grow, um, you know, what we've been able to recruit. Uh, we're really excited about the future. So, um, you know, there's so many people that go into uh, reestablishing the, the foundational pieces of, you know, one of the greatest programs in the history of college football. And, and um, you know, we got to continue to grow. Uh, we got to go chase championships. I know that's the standard at Tennessee, uh, but excited about the future. And, and uh, as far as, you know, being back in Orlando, uh, I mentioned it at the, the beginning. It's unlike you to show up late for a press conference. Right. <laughs> I, I thought that might get a couple of chuckles out of the <laughs> Orlando crowd, but maybe not. Uh, hotel. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, this is a great city. Um, my family, myself, we absolutely love living here. Um, a lot of our staff at Tennessee was with us here. Uh, it's been great to be back in the city. Um, you know, to the administration, Coach Malzahn at, at UCF, they were great in allowing us to go practice there. You know, we rode in the first day, rode through campus, um, get off the bus, we're sitting right next to the bounce house, um, get a chance to go on the practice field. It was a lot of fun because there's so many great memories that, uh, that came back. Got a chance to talk with a lot of people that have been a huge part of, uh, of my journey and our journey. So uh, it's been a great week. We had a night where you know, we had, I don't know, 25, 30 players that got an opportunity to come out of the hotel and kind of hang out. It was, a, it was a great night. All right, last couple will go here and then back left on the right side. Kind of building on what Scott asked uh, earlier, if we could put you in charge of college football for like a day and you could change some things about either the calendar or whatever, what would you do? What would you change, Kirk? Yeah, I think first thing we need a commissioner. Uh, you know, um, we talked a little bit about that yesterday. Just 
Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of independent contracting right now, and it's really hard to get people to visit. And I said something to Jim Delaney about that, I don't know, 13, 15 years ago. Uh, just, you know, sitting in meetings, listening. Uh, it really seems like, in my opinion, I'm going back over a decade, it seems like the five power five commissioners need to get in a room and visit. You know, maybe uh, throw a couple athletic directors and coaches in there as well, just to get some, you know, specific feedback, that type of deal. And you know, just have a summit and really basically blow everything up and try to start over again, maybe come up with a little better model. Uh, and that's, that's a while ago. So, I mean, things have changed, continue to change. There's a lot of things to address. But, but I think some type of um, common voice or, you know, common set of, we, we don't have any structure right now. I guess that's my biggest complaint. Uh, and there's not a lot of transparency when you talk about NIL, some of that, a lot of embellishment, a lot of stuff going on out there. So, you know, six years in the NFL, I've never had a bad job. I really enjoyed my time in the NFL. But one thing about the NFL, 32 teams all played by the same rules, same, you know, everything's the same. The field truly is level. Um, it's, it's a really good thing. If you can draft a good quarterback, uh, that's a good thing. That gives you an edge where if you have a really good owner and there are, um, you know, so certain jobs have inherent advantages, but, um, you know, at least at that league, like everybody kind of starts even. And when I was in the league, the Bengals were terrible. And now they've, you know, they've played at a really high level. So it just shows everybody's got an opportunity. I'm not sure college football is like that a little bit. And you know, somehow, some way, we just got to, we have to come up with some structure, I guess, if I came boiled it down to one thing. Uh, and then everybody, there was enforcement too, which is another thing the NFL has. And, you know, college football is really lacking in that department. So, uh, and it, it's hard because you've, you know, we've had a governing body try to overlook you know, however many schools play collegiate sports. And there's a big difference between, you know, football and, Whatever, you know, uh, football co college. The idea was up there 10 years ago, we were talking about some rules, cup blocking, coincidentally. And, uh, you know, he had no idea that he's voting on it. He's a really good guy, and so I'm not mad at it, but it's like, why are you voting on it? You don't, you don't have any idea on the topic. So it's just an illustration of some of the, you know, we need to, you know, centralize things a little bit and at least try to come up with some kind of structure that's, you know, workable for everybody. The games always you know, changed, and, and I think that's a positive thing, uh, growth. Um, it's changed so rapidly, so quickly, <coughs> that I do think you got to take a, you know, somebody has to take a hard look at, you know, how we put all these pieces together and continue to have the greatest game that there is and, and, uh, and do it the right way for everybody involved and, and players at the, the center point of that. And, to do that, I think you know you got to have all the all the players, uh, and when I said players, all, all the decision makers in the room, and somebody's got to grab a hold of the reins and, and uh, take it in the right direction. Yeah, we'll take one last one on the left here. Hmm. All right. Paige Dower, WBLC, and I'm still back here. Um, Coach Simbanks was asked the other day about losing a few guys to the transfer portal and how he viewed it. He called it an opportunity. How would you say the younger guys have taken advantage of that opportunity or like risen to the challenge, especially in this final week? Yeah, our, our practice and our preparation back home in here has been really good. Um, you know, <clears throat> the bowl season, and you know, Coach was talking about the changes, you know, during the course of his career to it. There's more guys that, you know, have opted out. You got guys that have made decisions to go to the NFL, some have hit the portal. Um, it creates opportunity for, for guys that maybe, you know, haven't played a ton on a unit. Um, you know, they've gotten some reps, probably played a lot of special teams, but. Um, it's an opportunity for uh, the young guys to, to take ownership and go prove that they're ready to go play at a high level. And, and uh, in some ways, these bowl games are, you know, culmination and a finish to the 23 season, but they're also, you know, the start and, and kick off for a lot of those young guys to, to 24. All right. Coach Heifel, Coach Ferris, thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate your time as we have all week, and good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Coach. Thanks. Thank